from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Yep, it's a library. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, we're so honored to have everyone here today. I'm Roswell Encina, I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, she welcomes everyone here this morning. We're excited to see everyone here today. Um, now, today's program is in remembrance of Jonah Eskin, his parents, Marsha and Barney, keep his memory alive by supporting the Young Reader Center here at the library and by supporting programs like this this morning. Um, we would like to um, spotlight Marsha and Barney who are here this morning. We would love them to stand and be acknowledged by this amazing crowd. Once again, their generosity has allowed us to do programs like this and do all the wonderful programs that we do at the Young Reader Center. Also, by the way, this week is Children's Book Week. Um, that's one thing we could probably agree on, that books, you know, bright in the day, it's like the light of the room. Um, when I was a kid, all those uh, Dr. Seuss books were my favorites. Then when I became a teenager, um, it's gonna show my age, but I love those Hardy Boys books. Um, so nowadays, you guys are probably, there's a lot of books to choose from, especially for young adults. Um, you know, there's the John Green books, the uh, Neil Gaiman books, um, I could go on and on, um, but you're very lucky with the selection of books that you have nowadays. We're very also lucky to have a wonderful group of students here from the district, and when I call out your school, I need you to give, you, you know, you have to show some love for your school and make a major cheer, okay? It's up to you. First, the Thurgood Marshall School. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. That's a, there was a slight pause there. I thought they weren't here. All right. All right, all right. Okay. The School Without Walls at Francis Stevens. <laughs> okay. I think I created something here. I know we're going to try to one-up each other. The Langley School. <laughs> the Lowell School. <laughs> All right. The Seed School. All right. And the last one, the Washington Global PCS. Yeah. We're also happy to have all of you here today, so just one big round of applause for all of you. Now, you're not the only teenagers watching, by the way. Today's event is being streamed on the, on the Library of Congress's Facebook and um, YouTube channel. So for everybody watching online, hello. <laughs> A lot of love from Washington. And you know, we just want to say to all, hi to all the kids who are watching Coast to Coast. Okay. We got to simmer it down now. <laughs> all right. Now, we're here today to talk about a major moment in civil rights history. Um, couple, several months ago, about a year ago, um, the movie Loving came out, and it was based on this very important um, Supreme Court decision. How many of you have heard of the Lovings? All right. The adults say yes, so we're hoping at, before this morning's over, we'll, we'd have um, educated uh, the students here today. Um, believe it or not, there was a time in American history that um, white Americans and African, Amer African Americans could not get married. I know it's very hard to wrap your head around that nowadays, but that was a dark time in this history and you could have been thrown in jail if a couple got married. 
And that's what happened with the Lovings. Mildred Jeter, Jeter, who was black, and Richard Loving, who was white, lived in not so far Virginia. They got married here in Washington, and when they went home to Central Point, they were arrested and sentenced to a year in prison just because they were married. Yes, really hard to imagine that now. Their case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and 50 years ago this year, they won. Their case changed the law across the country so that one's race does not determine who one can marry. The story has just been published in a new book called Loving Versus Virginia. We have the author here today, Patricia Herbie Powell, and the book's illustrator, Chandra Strickland, who's joined us here on the stage. We're also joined by an expert lawyer and educator, Georgetown law professor Elizabeth Hayes Patterson. She's been teaching law for almost 40 years, and one of her specialties is race and the law. And to lead our discussion this morning, I'm very lucky to introduce her. She's been a friend of mine for almost a decade now. We go a long way. Um, she's the coordinator of school and student services for Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library, where she spent more than 40 years as a mentor, teacher, and advocate for librarians and young adults just like you. Um, just, you know, I used to work at the Pratt Library with Deb, and um, we've come a long way from the Today Show to, to this morning. So please, Deb Taylor will be leading today's discussion. Once again, thank you for joining us, and I'll pass it on to Deb. Well, good morning, and it's good to be with you um, to discuss this incredible book that uh, treats its subject and the people who live this piece of our history with such artistry, eloquence, and care. And because this story is so important to who we are as a nation, we're going, also gonna place it in its social and historical context. As Roswell told you, I'm joined by an esteemed panel, and following their introductions, they will each give us brief thoughts about the work and the times that it depicts. We're going to begin with a brief video about the landmark decision that we commemorate today. God-given right, I think. Mildred Loving married the boy next door, Richard Loving. Richard Loving is a construction worker, Mildred Loving the daughter of a sharecropper. They were born and raised in Caroline County, Virginia, where white and colored people seem unaware of the racial prejudice that exists in much of the country. The Lovings didn't know that it was a crime for a white person to marry a Negro in Virginia. They found out the hard way. But I didn't realize how bad it was until we got married. Full of love themselves, they didn't expect to find hate in others. Their home swarms with children, their own three, as well as neighborhood friends who enjoy the warmth here. Mrs. Loving recalls how the ordeal began one night in 1958. The, the night we were arrested, mm -hmm. um, I guess it was about 2 a.m. And I saw this light, you know, and I woke up and there was the policeman standing beside the bed, <laughs> and he told us to get up, that we was under arrest. You go ahead and play. And anyway, they carried us to Bowling Green and uh, locked us up. And in January, they had the trial. And they uh, told us to leave the state for 25 years. But the way I understood it, the lawyer said that we could come back to visit, you know, when we wanted to. So that Easter, we came back and they got us again. We had been down a few times before that, but at Easter we came down, they found us down, they arrested us again. The Loving spent five years in a Negro ghetto in Washington, D.C., where they suffered the indignities of unemployment, loneliness, and uncertainty. When one of the children, unused to city streets, was hit by a car, Mrs. Loving decided to act. She wrote a letter to the then Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, who in turn passed the letter on to a Virginia lawyer, Bernard Cohen, a member of the Civil Liberties Union. We have three children and cannot afford an attorney. We wrote to the Attorney General. He suggested that we get in touch with you for advice. Please help us if you can. Hope to hear from you real soon. Yours truly, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Loving. And it was that simple letter that got us into this not-so-simple case. Bernard Cohen could and did help the Lovings. He teamed up with another attorney, Phil Hirschkopf, and at no fee, they reopened the Loving case in the Virginia courts. 
appealing each losing decision until at last the United States Supreme Court heard these arguments. Arguing protection, we advance the argument that these statutes are slavery statutes. They're meant to keep the Negro people in the badges and bonds of slavery. The outrageous civil effects of these statutes are not always apparent right away. For example, if Richard Loving were to die, then Mildred Loving would not be able to collect Social Security benefits as his widow. Uh, what is fundamentally important, though, is we ask the court to decide that a state may not pay, pass a law which proscribes marriage between two consenting, competent adults based on race alone. The attorneys for the state of Virginia refused to talk with ABC. Bernard Cohen described their arguments. They seem to say that there was a present-day justification for these laws, that is, that uh, uh, they're interested in the welfare of the children of such marriages. Today, the United States Supreme Court handed down a decision. The Loving's ordeal is at last over. Richard and Mildred Loving have won the right to be man and wife, father and mother, in the state of Virginia. Anti-miscegenation laws have been declared illegal not only in Virginia, but in all 16 states that have held such statutes. This is Hope Ryden, ABC News reporting. Before we begin, we'd also like to remind the adults in our audience that the last 20 minutes of the program are for questions and answers between the students and the participants on the stage. If time allows and there are no students at the microphones set up in the aisles, we'll take some questions from adults. Patricia Harubi Powell danced throughout the Americas and Europe with her dance company One Plus One before becoming a storyteller and writer of children's books. Her picture book, Josephine, The Dazzling Life of Josephine Baker, has garnered various honors, including the Robert F. Seibert Honor, Coretta Scott King Honor for Illustration, Boston Globe Hornbook for Nonfiction, Bologna Ragazzi Nonfiction, and Parents' Choice Gold for Poetry. Her documentary novel that we're here to talk about today, Loving versus Virginia, um, for young adults is a Junior Literary Guild selection for 2017, and her middle grade nonfiction, Strutting with Some Barbecue, is forthcoming in 2018. Chandra Strickland studied design, writing, and illustration at Syracuse University, and later went on to complete her MFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. She won the Ezra Jack Keats Award and Coretta Scott King John Steptoe Award for New Talent in 2009 for her work in her first picture book, Bird, written by Zetta Elliott. Strickland co-illustrated Our Children Can Soar, winner of a 2010 NAACP Image Award. Shadda travels the country conducting workshops, sharing her work with children, teachers, and librarians. She currently works and teaches illustration at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. She's an incredible asset to Baltimore arts and the literary community, leading the effort to bring the Ezra Jack Keats bookmaking competition to Baltimore City's public schools, thus encouraging the next generation of artists and writers. Elizabeth Hayes Patterson is currently the Associate Director of the Association of American Law Schools, headquartered here in Washington, D.C. She's also an Emerita Associate Professor of Law of the Georgetown University Law Center. Before joining the Law Center faculty, she served as chair of the D.C. Public Service Utilities Commission and was a commissioner of the D.C. Public Service Commission. At Georgetown, she taught conflict of law, contracts, race and American law, commercial law, sales transaction, and the civil rights movement. From, uh, she's also served as associate dean of the, for the JD and graduate programs at the Law Center with responsibility for the supervision of academic programs. She received the Law Center's Faculty Member of the Year Award, and in 2001, she, won, she received the Law Center's Frank F. Flegel Teaching Award. And Elizabeth will lead us off with her comments. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, first I have to give a shout out to two schools. I welcome all the students, but I have to recognize those from the Thurgood Marshall School. Thurgood Marshall was started by two Georgetown University Law Center graduates, so special welcome to you. And a special welcome to those from C Public Charter School where our son Malcolm was a resident instructor. 
So I want to pick up on something you heard in the tape, and that is one of the lawyers, Gil Hirschkopf, referred to the fact that what they wanted to do was to address a law that was a vestige of slavery. So let's begin the legal discussion by going back to the post-Civil War period. There were three important amendments that were adopted at that time. And the goal was to fundamentally change the status of the former slaves. So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. We'll go back to the 14th in, the min in a minute. The 15th Amendment gave the right to vote, denied the ability of a state to withhold the vote from people on the basis of race. Okay. Of course, you have to realize that that only affected African American men. African American women had to wait another 50 years, along with all women in this country, to get the right to vote. The 14th Amendment, which is the one that was most involved in this case, is the amendment that guaranteed two things. That an individual in a state could not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without what's called due process of law. And the second was to guarantee the equal protection of the laws in the states. So what did equal protection of the laws mean for the former slaves? The Supreme Court answered that in 1896 in a case titled Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson came out of the state of Louisiana. Louisiana had a law that said that black people and white people have to be separated in railroad cars. They cannot sit together in the same car, let alone the same seat. Homer Plessy challenged that law. And he, as you might imagine, assumed that with the passage of the 14th Amendment and the guarantee of equal treatment under the law, that that law would be struck down. That didn't happen. The Supreme Court determined that the states could separate people by race as long as things were equal. And so this doctrine of separate but equal was a doctrine that lasted for a long time and allowed states to pass laws, which they did, that either required or allowed the separation of people by race in movie theaters, in restaurants, in libraries, in restrooms. During that period of time also was when Virginia passed the Racial Integrity Act, which is described, if you look at the slide, it's in the bottom middle, the Virginia Bulletin explains this act. And it basically said that white and non-white people cannot marry. And if they do, it's a crime. So this was what we had as law, separate but equal. Laws like the state of Virginia's that prohibited marriage between people of different races. Until 1954. And in 1954, the Supreme Court decided the case of Brown versus Board of Education. And I'm sure you've all heard about that. That was the case where the court looked at this whole separate but equal doctrine and determined, and if you look, same slide, to the left, bottom left, Brown versus Board of Education, there's the important language where the court said when it comes to education, separate is inherently unequal, meaning there's no way there's equality when the state says black children have to go to school here, white children have to go to school who, there. Totally unacceptable. That ushered in what we call the period of a, a new civil rights movement, if you will. And two important events happened the next year in 1955. In August of 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Till was in Mississippi, and he was murdered. And he was murdered, why? Because it's alleged that he insulted a white woman. How did he insult her? He either whistled or he said something to her. That's it. And then in December of 1955, I know you remember, Rosa Parks, Mrs. Rosa Parks, refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and the Montgomery bus boycott started. So that is, and after that in 1955, one other important thing, 
The state of Virginia announced that it would engage in massive resistance to the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. And on the slide, lower right, you see a reference to Senator Harry Byrd of Virginia who talked about that fact. Virginia resisted so much that they closed the public schools rather than integrate them. And there was one county in Virginia, Prince Edward County, about 90 miles from here, where the schools stayed closed for five years, from 1959 to 1964. So that is the atmosphere within which Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving had their relationship begin. So you can see that we have a very dramatic time, but we're talking about people who are living their lives and who are not necessarily caught up in the drama as we saw on the slide. So now we come to that story and I'd wanna start with, by asking Patricia, why? Why this story for this time when so many of our young people don't know this history or may not feel it applies to them? Why did this story compel you to write about it? It's a story of um, love. You know, the name of the couple, the, the uh, Loving, their name was Loving, and they were very much in love, and I got to tell a love story uh, in and amongst the civil rights movement. All those slides that you were seeing on Ginger Elizabeth's um, uh, page were pages of uh, the book, as are you know, these in front of you. And uh, I came from a very socially conscious family, and we saw by example that when somebody needed help, you helped. So it was a very compelling story for this reason. You want me to go into the research? Sure. Okay. Um, before the story even begins, we have the health bulletin called the Racial Integrity Act that Walter Plecker in 1924 put into place in Virginia, and it was the law in Virginia until 1967 when the U.S. Supreme uh, Court ruled in favor of interracial marriage. And what it says, I'm not sure if you can read it up there, but about two-thirds down it says, there are people in Virginia who are posing for white, but they're not really white. If you are 1 16th Native American, then you can call yourself white if everything else in your family is white. But if you are 1 16th African American and everything else is white, you are not white. And that means if you have one great great grandparent who is African American, then you are um, not a white person. So what it's saying is we know that there are people in there pretending to be white who are intermarrying, but you may not do that. And if we catch you, it's against the law. So on the right there, we have the photograph of the classrooms, the white classroom and the black classroom. And this is under the separate but equal law that Ginger was mentioning, the Plessy versus Ferguson. Does that look equal to you, those two classrooms? I don't think so. So, could I have the slide changed, please? I did my research in eastern, um, in Virginia, Caroline County, where the family lived in a very integrated neighborhood in a very segregated state. This is Otha Jeter, Mildred Jeter's older brother. Both Mildred and Richard are deceased but I talked to family members and friends of the family. And um, the place is very important here because my story starts, our story starts in 1952. The movie starts when they get married in 58, but our story starts in 52 when Mildred is 11 years old and Richard is about 16 or 17 years old. And they grew up in this neighborhood together and I got stories from the family members of what happened in their lives. During, you know, doing my research, I used primary sources, which are artifacts from the time, and I just thought it was interesting to see how messy they are. Um, <laughs> on on the, um, oh, the very top one, it reads, Richard Jeter, a white man, and 
you know, Mitchell, Richard Loving, a white man, and Jeter. They don't even dignify her to give her name. She is white and she's black and her name is not even on it. But here is her uh, arrest warrant, this mess of a page below it. And she was arrested in bed in 1958 after they were married. And then another, um, <clears throat> and then they were exiled. We, got, we know a lot of the story that says they were sentenced to a year in jail or 25 years exile. They were exiled. They lived in a slum in Washington, D.C. So that was 58. And in 1963, they tried to get the course, the, uh, the case, um, the ACLU lawyers, Bernie Cohen and Phil Hirschkop, back into the courts by bringing it to Leon Bazile, who was the judge for the case. And he wrote this very racist statement, um, which was actually very helpful to um, the ACLU lawyers because it was so racist. And what he said was, Almighty God, there it is. thank you. Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, melee, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with his arrangement, this, his arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. And Mildred thinks about that and said, hmm, this was a nation of red people that was stolen by white people, and the black people were stolen from the African people. And I don't know if she really said that. That is speculation. This is a documentary novel, means it's an informational book. But I told it in the voices of Richard and Mildred. There are many. You, you talked about some of the documents that are a part of the book. And I think that creates a particular um, context for students. And Shadra, I have to ask you, because it's unusual to have a book that is written for teenagers, primarily, um, to have illustrations. What do you think your illustrations brought to the text and brought to the story? Well, I'd, I'd been doing, I teach at Maryland Institute College of Art, and I teach a class called Visual Journalism, where we take students out into the world and draw on location. Um, and I had wanted to sort of use these drawings in some real context, but they wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for a picture book for very young readers. Um, but my agent was like, let's just put them on the website and see what happens. And so Chronicle Books, our publisher, saw these images and they contacted me about contributing to this book. So I got really lucky, basically. <laughs> um, but I think the illustrations add um, more of the love story. And you can see the slide behind us is one of my favorite illustrations um, of Richard and Mildred sort of stealing away to, to run through the woods and, and spend time with each other. Um, and when I talked to the art director and the editor at Chronicle, we really wanted to focus on their lives as, as just individual people as opposed to the law and the, the other um, interference with that life. So I think that the illustrations add that level of softness, you know, and, and hopefully um, a bit of magic um, between the two of them and showing their chemistry and their love for one another. And illustrations are nice, right? It's nice to look at beautiful <laughs> drawings um, in the middle of um, a lot of sort of intense sort of uh, legal documents and, and the story itself, so. Elizabeth, I remember that news clip. I'm old enough that <laughs> that's not something new to me to see that news clip when the decision came down. Yet I also remember that there were states as late as 2000 that were just removing the laws from the books. What did that mean, if anything? Why were they holding on to those laws if it had been struck down through the Loving case? Well, unfortunately, even though the law may be one way, uh, legislatures are sometimes very slow to act to change. Uh, I can't say I can't uh, read into the minds of the uh, legislators, and that was in Alabama that mm -hmm. finally in, in that the year finally 2000. Did, yes. That's right. And so I can't, I can't say that it was an act of defiance. Um, I suspect that it was maybe a little of that and a little of just not wanting to do it, um, not thinking that it was an important thing to do. The important thing is that despite the fact that Alabama did not remove the law from the books until 2000, the law was changed. Mm -hmm. Once the Supreme Court made the decision, that was it. So, One of the things that stood out for me from reading the book was 
Um, even though there were all of these social restrictions on Richard and Mildred when they were in Virginia, Virginia was home. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, comes across both in the illustrations and in the poetry is the fact that that was, even with all of its problems, it was home. Mm -hmm. How were you able to get that across? Um, that this whole idea of the distinction between being, being exiled, so to speak, and then being able, wanting so desperately to come home. May I talk? Yeah, okay. please. <laughs> um, it was, uh, well, it starts in 1952 when Mildred is 11 years old, and Richard is sort of the uh, background because he is friends with her big brothers. And so it shows how they grow up together in this interracial, intergenerational, uh, sort of idyllic setting where um, they had parties after the families. They were self-sufficient farmers, and there would be hog slaughtering time. So after hog slaughtering and all the neighbors came to help, there would be a big party. And Mildred's older uh, brothers and father played in a string band, and they were the entertainment for the neighborhood. And so there, you know, there's this, this beautiful community of whites and blacks and Indians um, together who just had this wonderful life and to be exiled in Washington was so very different. They lived in a very small apartment with, and it was dirty and there were lights on all the time. It was you know, opposed to the nature, the natural world around them. It just did not feel like earth to Mildred to be in Washington, D.C. She wanted the, the pastoral scene of her childhood and her family, a very close-knit family and the neighbors were all friends. Chandra, could you speak to the book design? You sure, can I talk a little bit about the other, I, the family? So I grew up in Georgia, in Atlanta, and the civil rights movement was the topic of conversation at the dinner table all the time with my family. Um, so in making the illustrations, even though I didn't have a time machine where I could go back in time and just kind of sit there and draw the lovings as they grew up, um, things felt very familiar in the writing, you know, with my own mother and siblings and the way that we sort of manage community and my grandmother, you know, growing collard greens and tomatoes. Um, so it was, it was helpful to have grown up with that experience to be able to make it real in the illustrations. Um, but the book design, Chronicle makes really beautiful books. Like if you see, you'll see the book, it's gorgeous. Um, I really love this, you know, day glow orange, um, cover, hardcover that we have, but I felt like we worked closely together in sort of talking about the mood that we wanted to portray in the, in the story. And I'll show you some, can we get the next slide, please? Um, the next one, the next one, <laughs> the next one. The next one. <laughs> okay, one more, <laughs> that one. <laughs> so the first thing that we understood going in was that we wanted the book to be printed in two colors to sort of give a nod to two color printing um, back uh, during the day when printing was more expensive and um, you could only afford to print with a limit number, limited number of colors. So you can see here in these slides this is some of the conversation that I was having with the designer, which is great. Most times I don't get to work that closely with the designer of a book, but because I have design background, um, we were able to have intelligent conversations. So these are the two choice, I sent maybe, I don't know, four or five different color choices. I was really in love with the sort of green and rusty red um, color combination, but that felt a little too heavy. And then we finally got to this sort of purple and gold, which when they overlapped, they made a really nice rich brown, which made sense for um, illustrating um, Mildred. Um, so it, it worked out and it was just great fun to be able to work with Chronicle. A big part of visual journalism is um, back in the 50s, Leo Leone was an art director for Fortune magazine and he really brought visual journalism to the forefront and hired illustrators to do what they wanted to do, basically go out on location and draw, but there was a lot of trust that had to go into that relationship and I really felt that Chronicle gave me that when we were working on this book together. I think we have time for one more um, little bit of discussion here, and I'd like to talk um, about the 14th Amendment just for mm -hmm. a moment, mm -hmm. um, since so much of the case hinged on that, and you, you made reference to it in your, in your opening remarks. And how were they able to, to zero in on the 14th Amendment and to make their case when they had not been successful 
at all of the lower courts? Was it just because they were with a more sympathetic court or was, were they able to craft a story or craft a way of understanding the 14th Amendment that won their case? I think that the lawyers assumed that they would not prevail in Virginia at any level. And based upon the history of the state, that was accurate. Uh, we've referred to the 1924 Racial Integrity Act, but Virginia and Maryland were the first two colonies, even before this was a country, that had passed laws prohibiting interracial marriage. So this is a very mm -hmm. long, entrenched history in the state of Virginia. So I think it isn't that they, they crafted different arguments. They made the same arguments with respect to the equal protection and due process rights of the, of the lovings but they knew that they weren't going to prevail in Virginia with that long, that, that very entrenched history. With the Supreme Court, they made basically two arguments. One is that marriage is a fundamental right for everybody. Everybody ought to be able to make a decision if you've got consenting adults, and this is one of the things that uh, Phil Hirschkopf said, when you have two consenting adults who want to marry, to deny that right on the basis of race is unconstitutional. It interferes with the fundamental right, and it makes a classification based on race which is not allowed under the 14th Amendment. So that's why they were successful in making those arguments. But we also have to remember that we've had Brown versus Board of Education right. decided. So we had to have a change to separate but equal in order to get to loving. Mm. Well, before we move to opening the microphones up to the students, I do want to give um, a shout out to a wonderful teacher's guide that the uh, publisher of the book has prepared. It was actually done by a colleague, Dr. Um, Ebony Thomas from the University of Pennsylvania. And so there are great questions and opportunities to, um, to really pursue these subjects. Um, in a much more in-depth way. I think that we've been given a great introduction to how we can see this story and how we can place it in our own national history. So if there are students who have questions, would you please approach the microphones? I see there's somebody approaching the microphones. That's great. And bear with me because I can see nothing. These lights are shining in my eyes. So if I miss someone who is standing at a microphone, you might need to do a little wave. Yes, that oh, helps. that's better. That helps. Yes. Is there someone? Once they start, they won't stop. While we're, waiting for, while we're waiting for a student to come to the microphone, I do have, I have another question okay. for um, Patricia particularly. Has, <clears throat> we, we focus a lot on, on the lovings and, and as a couple, um, and we, we see how they grow together in their community. Was there any, did you find any kind of written information about the children that that grew up in that household at that time when they were trying to establish their legal, their legal right to be married. Are you talking about Richard and, Richard and, and Mildred's, Mildred's children? children. Um, they were, what I know about that is that the parents did not want their children to have anything to do with it. I mean, they did not want their children to be burdened by it mm -hmm. in any way. So they kept it from their children. So their children did not know much about it at through. all. Plus, they were quite young. You know, they were, uh, you know, this was 19, uh, up till 1967. They were born in the late 50s, so they were under 10 years okay. old. Do we have a question yet? Okay. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on the book? On the book? What was the question? What, he, he, what oh. are your thoughts about the book? What are, what, are you, what are your thoughts about how the book might be received by young people? I think um, when I receive the book, so when we're working on these things, it's all sort of in the air, right? It doesn't become a book until it becomes a book. So you're delivering these beautiful words, you're delivering this artwork, um, and you're having conversations about what the book might look like and you know how it is received, but you never know until you get it. And when I receive this in the mail, the first thing I thought as an artist, like, oh, it's, it's so beautiful. Like, it's just such a beautiful, substantial, 
book, um, a very important piece of, of, it feels very important in your hands. Um, so I was glad for that. And I think that young readers will appreciate that as they're, they're reading the story and sort of taking it very seriously as a, as a piece of literature. Um, and in terms of the story itself, it's a beautiful love story. It really is a beautiful love story. And Patricia can talk a bit more about that. Well, I think partly what's so interesting about it is the story is all told in verse. There's a whole lot of white space on the page. So it's easy to read. It's fast to read. There are photographs from the civil rights movement, most of which I first found at the Library of Congress. And, um, <laughs> and <there's> a, <laughs> it's not like you just go to the Library of Congress and say, may I have that photo, please. There's quite a process. You find the photo at the Library of Congress, and then you find out who owns it, and you find out um, who you must pay to get permission to use it. But I think that you look at these photographs. This one is race mixing is communism. And you go, whoo, that's interesting. And you think about it, and you uh, go, what does that mean? And I think what it means is in 1959, when this photo was taken and where this is placed in the book in 1959, the timeline of the book, the US was just terrified of communism and the USSR. And uh, it was just the worst slur you could use for an American. So they just used it. And so there's a whole lot of American history in here that sort of, um, it just gives you, it gives you a view of the civil rights movement, a particular thread mm -hmm. of the civil rights movement. We've got the Freedom Riders, we have the lunch counters. I think we have another person yes. at the microphone. Got a question up here. Um, what challenges did you face while writing the book? I'm sorry? What challenges did you face while working on or the Or like book? creating or drawing or Creative just challenges making it. You, did you face? Um, in making the illustrations, the hardest thing was sort of taking this idea of visual journalism and applying it to history, because I'd never done that before. All of my drawings prior to had been very, um, can we advance the slides a little bit? Had been very um, direct and on the spot. Is there no one direct? Okay, the slides aren't working. Um, so I think for me, the biggest challenge was um, the research, right? Mm -hmm. Where Patricia had spent, how, how long did you spend researching the book? Um, about an hour, an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Change that hour to a year. Right, right. It's, and a half. So knowing that the author had spent so much time researching the book, and my deadline was a little tighter for making the illustrations, um, I didn't want to make any mistakes, right? And um, you can see in this slide, my drawing process is instead of erasing mistakes, I would just sort of redraw it. So a lot of the drawings I would do seven, eight times before I felt like they were um, solid. But you know, I had to rely that YouTube clip that we saw was, was a, a main source of um, inspiration for me, even though Mildred was a little older during that interview. But having to find as many um, photographs as possible. This is a collection of photographs by a photojournalist named Gray Villette. And he spent time with the Lovings taking these pictures so that they could run this ad and like this article in Life Magazine. This was invaluable for me. Um, and I think that it's important for us now as we are a very sort of um, documentary society where we are Instagramming and Facebooking and Twittering, um, Twittering, I'm so tweeting. Old. Tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> tweeting. Um, you know, this, these things live on, right? And generations after us will go back and you know use this information. And I was I was grateful to have this, even though this wasn't done in the age of the internet. Thank you. And just before that next question, just want to remind you that the book will be on sale in the lobby at a discount price, so you will be able to purchase copies of the book today. Another question. Um, so obviously, like for them, it was like a really long process of like getting their whole case like all the way to the Supreme Court. And when they moved, like that was like hard for them. But why didn't they just like move somewhere that wasn't Washington D.C., like somewhere that was like more inclusive but not in Virginia? Because like I feel like it was like such like a long, hard process for them that it was kind of like, oh, if we just leave and go somewhere that's kind of similar, it would be like okay. So like, why do you think? Why didn't they, they? Why didn't they leave Virginia? No. And go? Why did they? Why did they go to D.C. instead of somewhere like more similar to where they were coming from? Oh. They they 
They wanted to be as close to home as possible. Right. And the nine years from the time they were arrested in 58 until it was decided in 1967 by the Supreme Court, they came home. They were rearrested once on Easter Sunday, or the day before Easter, and then they snuck home from time to time and stayed with her sister Garnet in an adjoining um, county, in King and Queens County, or Essex County, I believe. And uh, so they were close to home. Mm -hmm. And eventually they were given a stay of, um, a stay of? The, there was a, uh, well, there was a stay of their sentence, but the, the judge uh, amended, the second time amended the order so that they could go to Virginia, they couldn't cohabit. And, and at one point, they lived in, in an adjoining county, King, right. and Queen, King and Queen County. But they were supposed to lie very low and keep their apartment in Washington, D.C. so they could race home if there was any trouble. And, and of course, these weren't wealthy people. Right. Well, these weren't people with resources to move and to you know, move away from family where there was support and, right. Right. and what have you. And they, were, they didn't have a lot of educational background to exactly. change jobs and to do all of the things that we would think of today. Right. Right. Plus, I believe they lived with a one cousin. of Mildred's cousins, right. so right. that made it right. possible, as attractive as well. Thank Got another you. question? One over here? All right. So you all kept mentioning that um, if somebody, like a white person, was 1 16th African American, they weren't considered white, correct? So if he wasn't considered white or someone wasn't considered white and they were to date a black woman, would it still be frowned upon in society? Or if Richard Loving was 116th African American and wasn't considered white, would he have received the same punishment? Do you understand? If Richard had been? If Richard had been 1-16% African American and not considered oh. white and he still married um, Mildred, would he she was, still get the be same a problem. punishment? It wouldn't have, right. They, they both would be considered non-white. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. These, the, this, these laws that, that separated whites from blacks, the fact of the matter is from the beginning, this country hasn't just been white and black. There have been Latinos, there have been Asians. So one of the requirements when you start having laws that separate people into white and black is how do you characterize people who are neither white nor black? Right. You have to fit them into these categories. In fact, if you were, um, if you were Native American in Virginia during that, the tw between 24 and 67, you were colored because you were not white unless you lived on the reservation. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you could have your Native American status. But even the idea of 1 16th, like how can you even determine that, right? So Richard, potentially, if he were 1 16th African American or 1 16th Native American, he still potentially would have looked like he was a, a exactly. pure Caucasian man. And they probably still would have had to go through what they went through. Like there's, unless they did a DNA test, which would they have didn't happen back then, yes. there's still not really a way to prove that. Right. Question over here. Um, as opposed to all other court cases throughout history, why choose this one to write about? Uh, uh, with all of the, law, the legal cases that there were, uh, racially based legal cases, why this one? Why did this one compel you more than, than many others? Oh, as the author, well, it's the one that won. I mean, oh, it's the, I, I, of all <laughs> civil rights cases. As I said before, it's, it's, a love, it's a love story. I'd never written a love story before. I wanted to write it for teenagers. I'm a children's and, and young adult author, and I think love is kind of interesting. I got to do um, research, what I consider research, about love. And I talked to my husband a whole lot about our falling in love. But I also listened to music that I listened to when I was in my 20s, when I was falling in, the lo in love frequently. And I loved writing the scene for which Shadra showed you the illustration of them running through the woods. I find it the most incredibly romantic uh, it's a several pages long, but it's, it's very quick, and they never say a word. They just go out in the middle of the night. She sneaks out, and they run together. Woo! That's pretty cool. <laughs> We've got a question back here. Um, what was your motive for choosing this love story instead of other love stories? Why this love story, since you wanted to write a love story? Oh, well, because this, well, OK. I could say, in general, it's very attractive, it's very compelling, 
because it is a civil rights story. I had just finished writing Josephine, The Dazzling Life of Josephine Baker. Actually, I'd written it ages ago, but it was in production. And she was not only an African-American dancer who made it huge in Paris in the 20s, although she was American, she could not be a superstar in this country, and she was also a civil rights worker. Mm -hmm. So Chronicle Books knew that I was interested in civil rights. And Jeannie So, the, our publisher at, at um, Chronicle Books, asked me if I was interested in writing this story, and I absolutely was. And I really just have to give a huge shout out to Melissa Manlove, my editor, who just had a vision for this book that really has so much to do with why this book looks the way it does. Also, Jennifer Tolo Pierce, our designer. And it's sort of an interesting thing that the way Shadra and I communicate while we're making the book is I talk to Melissa, my editor. Melissa talks to Jennifer, the designer. The designer talks to Shadra. <laughs> and then it goes doot, 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 back again. So we didn't actually meet until March of this year after the book <laughs> came out. But that's how it goes in publishing. <laughs> wow. We've got time for one more question. If the movie was already out, why did you feel like you had to write a book about it as opposed to like, just watching the movie? I wrote the book long before the movie came out. Um, I started the book, I'm trying to remember, it was 2012. I think it was 2012. And first of all, it was supposed to come out in 2015. Then it was supposed to come out in 2016. <laughs> and then it came out in January 31st of 2017. So there was a world in which it would have come out earlier than the movie. And the, 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 um, the things that hold it back are things like um, a designer quit at um, Chronicle. And Jennifer Tolo Pierce, our designer, had to take over a whole lot of everybody else's work. And I don't know what else held it back. But now it's the 50th um, anniversary of the judgment, you know, uh, the US Supreme Judgment from 1967 to 2017. So it's kind of poetic that way, right? And then very often when there is a historic milestone commemoration, we will have a book, we'll have movies, we'll have right. um, TV shows, we'll have lots of discussions. So it's not just one piece of media right. that can address a story because we receive, we receive these stories in so many different formats. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to thank my esteemed panel <laughs> who did an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. I want to thank the Young Readers, the Young Readers Center for organizing today's um, event and all of the volunteers and all of the staff who really put things together for us and who worked to make sure. And, and to thank you for your wonderful questions and your wonderful contribution. So we hope that you will have a chance to read this book and see the wonderful change that it made in our country's history. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Deborah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.